to Architecting. I'm your host, Angela Mazzi. You made it. This is the landing pad for raw honesty about connecting your career with your purpose. I'm going to give you the tools you need to be an unapologetic advocate for yourself and others, because if you're here, You believe that the space we surround ourselves in matters and you're committed to project by project building a better world for all of us. If you're with me, let's get architecting. Hey Bright Lights, it's Angela and I am so glad you are here with me today. It has been a while. I really wanted to come on today and be very vulnerable about busyness, about chaos, about feeling like things are going out of control because I think we all experience this. We wouldn't be growing if our life always was going in perfect measure all day, every day, day in and day out because there would be no challenge there. And as we do the work on ourselves, it's kind of like peeling an onion, right? There's always going to be a new layer. As we learn, as we evolve and grow, our capacity to handle things gets greater. So when I think about taming the chaos, and that is front of mind because Tonight in our Stressless Success class, this is week five, and our theme is Taming the Chaos. And as I think about that and what it means, I realize that what I call chaos in my life today versus what I called chaos in my life even last year, but certainly five or ten years ago, are very, very different things. And I was reminded of this when we had to do a follow-up client meeting to resolve an issue on a project. And I knew the issues and just needed the user groups to focus on them so they could make a clear decision. So it wasn't that hard for me to put together a quick presentation that sort of summed up, this is the concept, do we agree or not? Let's adjust the concept accordingly. And then whatever the concept is, these are the decision trees. How do we want to proceed? But I was working with a younger project architect who thought the fact that the scheduled round of meetings didn't get to this issue and get it resolved was a failure. So she was kind of stressed out that this was still hanging in the air. And she had put a lot into this meeting in terms of her expectations and worrying about it and were we going to get an answer. And after the meeting, I was just kind of like, all right, yeah, we got that done. I got to move on to other things. I didn't even really think about anything because I knew we would get to an answer in that meeting. And I wasn't attached to the answer being any particular thing, just in going through that process, really framing things in a way where this group could get clarity, where they only had one issue to worry about. And there we go. So after the meeting was over, she comes over to my desk and she is all excited and she's like, high five, we did it, we crossed this major bridge. And I didn't want to be a buzzkill for her, but I was kind of like, well, yeah, we did. (laughs) I had to kind of stop and realize that at the point in her career where she was, It felt chaotic that this issue was unresolved. At the point in my career where I am, having been around the block doing this thing a few times maybe, I didn't view that follow-up meeting as that momentous. And I was confident that we would come out of that meeting with an answer. In her mind, it was very stressful and chaotic. In my mind, it was just about giving people who had had a lot to focus on in the regularly scheduled meeting a single clear point of focus, maybe bring in more stakeholders that weren't in the general meeting 
and really think about it and have it answer. Share this story because I think it's important that we all meet ourselves and the people in our lives where they are. Because if we only judge something by our own experience of it, we can have some pretty unrealistic expectations. And it goes both ways, up and down the chain. You can have unrealistic expectations of someone with less experience because you're forgetting where you were when you were where they are. But you can also have unrealistic expectations of a leadership team or the owners of your company or the people in charge because you think that they are laser focused on you and the issues you care about when their experience, their knowledge might temper that a little bit or they might see how to balance priorities in a way that you don't. Releasing expectations is an important way to kind of center yourself and feel better about what you're doing instead of feeling like you're always kind of pushing ropes. I want to share this very vulnerably because I've been going through a period of being very busy and I usually only work on projects in certain phases and have a lot more freedom to pursue things that are more research-based or concept-based with just the climate of the projects that our firm has been working on. We've got two really large projects that I have the good fortune of being the lead medical planner on. That is a privilege. That really is an honor to be able to shape to such influential projects. But it also means that I've had to get more into the weeds as the projects move forward past concepts and schematic design and even the early stages of design development and get into the nuts and bolts of where does this monitor go on the wall? And, you know, there was a time in my career when I lovingly detailed a sink encounter in a clinical space. And I thought about how we would conceal things like the soap dispenser and the paper towels and the glove dispensers and all of the other stuff that gets put on the wall that creates visual clutter. So I've been there. I've gone through that. I've cared about that stuff. I have drawn the details. I have looked at the spec sheets for all of these accessories and designed to their dimensions. But I am not at that phase in my career anymore. It is really an area of focus for someone else, not because it doesn't matter or because it isn't important, but I'm not there. And so having to suddenly be immersed in all this detail again can be a little bit of an irritant, And having these two projects with major rounds of user meetings overlapping was a lot. The people helping me were very different. Some were very diligent and conscientious. Others were a little bit sloppy. And some were just plain lazy and having to deal with the challenge of lack of experience coupled with lack of ambition, lack of willingness to ask questions. That was another challenge because should I be micromanaging someone? It isn't my job to do that. They should really be supervised by the project architect, not by the medical planner. On and on and on. That was going on. On top of that, my son is doing all of this stuff. He has a gorgeous voice. I think I might have mentioned before, he's in three different choirs. And as the end of the school year, end of the year is coming up, everybody has something going on. So there were end of year recitals. There was also for the one festival he is in where it's citywide and he sings with the Cincinnati Symphony. 
big performance is this week-long event called the May Festival. And he had to perform in that and had practices that would go late into the evening, multiple days of the week, including the weekends. So that was a lot. His choir director at school decided they should sing for graduation. So that was a fun day, trying to juggle both a mandatory practice for one choir and getting him to graduation, so we had to kind of split the difference. Plus, on top of all that, I had enrolled him in online driver's ed when he turned 15 and a half, got his permit. The hope was he would be done, go for his driver's test around the time he turned 16 in February. Except my son has ADHD and online learning, not a strong suit. Plus the program was super glitchy. So I have spent literally months chasing him down going, did you do it? Did you do it? Did you do it? And towards the end of March, he told me that at the end of February, the program had timed out because you only have six months to complete it. And they won't give you your money back or restart it for you. Even if you pay again, you can't pick up where you left off because the state law prohibits that. So I had to then enroll him in in in-person driver's ed, which was this super immersive class, which was a good thing, but it meant that it was four hours a day, two evenings a week for three weeks. Guess when that interval was? You got it, the month of May, with all of this other stuff going on. On top of that, I also had some personal things to deal with, with a relationship that had ended over a year ago, but there still were some unresolved issues, some things that, frankly, the guy needed to come and get some of his stuff and was avoiding me, and this had been going on for months, and I was just done with the whole thing. I was really busy, had a lot going on, both at work and in my personal life, had a lot of emotions to deal with, too. A lot of frustration with people who weren't doing what I had hoped they would do, who were difficult to deal with, who were creating more stress for me in an already stressful situation because of their choices. And what I realized, and I'm sure you realize this too when you are going through a period of great stress, is that you become much less in your higher self and much more focused just on getting your needs met because stress, let's not forget, is a survival mechanism. We feel stress because our body evolved to go into fight or flight when there was danger or threat. In our modern world, Thank God we don't encounter many physical threats where we actually have our life in danger. However, we do still experience the stress response and our body does not know the difference between a person who is frustrating us or an overwhelming amount to do or expectations that we're afraid we're not going to meet and being chased by a tiger does not know the difference. So the things that our body evolved to respond to when it feels stress are 100% related to physical escape, whether that's fight or flight. That isn't clearly what we can do when we have modern world stresses put upon us. So we still feel the need to go into survival mode. We still have our immune system shutting down, our digestive system shutting down. We still have our higher level of thought shutting down. But because the stress is chronic, we are not burning off the hormones that keep all those processes in play. So it's even more heightened. And as the stress builds, the focus on survival becomes more and more and more and more acute. 
And as that happens, we become more and more focused on ourselves and getting what we need out of a situation than on being strategic or higher level thought. What results from this is an emotional hangover. Our emotions are tied to all of the hormones in our endocrine system, and there are hundreds. When the adrenaline and cortisol, especially, that get activated when we're stressed out, flood our body, it starts to be toxic because we're not getting it out of our system, but it's also impacting other hormones that govern things like our sleep, our appetite, our mood. So everything gets out of whack, and it is literally as if you had gone on a bender. You have this hangover, and you may not have the exact same physical symptoms as you would after a night of partying, but your body is still in that toxic state nonetheless. One thing I notice is that the adrenaline, it almost creates a mini cyclone in my energy field because I have to summon all of this energy in order to get through all of these demands on my time and on my mental bandwidth. The more the cyclone spins, it goes faster and faster and faster, and the harder it is for me to slow it down. And very often through the last few weeks, I've had these moments of anger, guilt, and shame where I think about something I did or said and go, oh, I could have done that better. And it's not that I did anything really horrible or bad, but it's just that sense of, I could have done that better. I could have been more sensitive. I could have said thank you. I could have said good job more. But I was too focused on, and the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing, and let's get it done. So I was forgetting to be so incredibly proud of my son for all he has accomplished. I was forgetting to appreciate the growth an incredible commitment of some of these team members as they are on their career journey. I was forgetting to take more time to meditate and center myself because I just couldn't slow my mind down. And a lot of this really comes from being in a lack mentality. And it's something that I think we all carry with us because our brains, again, part of how we evolve for survival, focus on what we don't have more than what we do have. And some of it is cultural. So I am the grandchildren of immigrants. My parents dealt with being first generation Americans. They dealt with a lot of prejudice, a lot of unfair treatment. And as a result, the evolved response of my parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, etc. was to be hypercritical of themselves and of me. There was high expectation for accomplishment, but also once something was accomplished, there was always this what's next, what's next. And while that's good, we always should look at what's next. The underlying current was somehow that where I was was never good enough. And that is what I really want to focus on today as we think about that emotional hangover in how we avoid going on that bender in the first place, but also how we come down from it. And it really comes down to that lack mentality. While we always will have more we want to do and be, while we are only going to be fulfilled in continually growing and expanding, we cannot look at where we want to be and not appreciate where we are. We forget how the struggle is the growth. We forget 
how much we've done to get to exactly the spot where we stand today. And we forget to be grateful for what we have because we're so focused on what we don't have. I want you to think right now about what is going on in your life that is really great. Even if it could get better, think about how it's great. Think about how comfortable your bed is or how wonderful it is to have internet service and the connectivity that we have or the people in your life that have supported you, the mentors that you've had over the years. Think about what you have achieved at this point in your life, whether it's in your personal life or your career, and really be in gratitude, not only to the others who helped make this possible, and others can be particular people, but they can also be, thank you for the people that invented a certain technology or a certain process because it made it easier to do what I needed to do. Really feel that gratefulness instead of feeling that you have to do and do and do all the time. Stay centered. Focus on what you can feel joy around. Focus on the choices that will allow you to thrive And thriving doesn't mean it comes easy or you don't have to work for it or it isn't going to be a little bit uncomfortable, but it will make you thrive. And let that lead you to inspired action. When you have those moments, like I did over the last month of going, oh, I could have done that better. Be grateful for those too because They are showing you your growth. I wouldn't have had that thought a few years ago. I would have felt justified in feeling frustrated or not felt that I needed to tell someone they did a good job because, well, yeah, they did an okay job, but they screwed this up. That's where my mind would have been. The fact that I could say I didn't criticize them and... I caught the fact that I could have praised them. That is growth. So rather than feel bad and say, oh, I really wish I could have done, I can say thank you because now I know how to do it better. Now I have that awareness and next time I will do that. It helps to also be really focused on what is your mission What do you really care about? Because when you do that, you don't have to focus on, am I being seen? Am I being heard? Am I being treated fairly? All of the stuff our ego tells us matters because our ego is tied to that stress response, tied to survival, tied to feeling safe. But instead, Make it about the mission. Make it about what really matters to you. And know that it is not your job to change other people. You are just there to share your work, to help raise awareness, to seek opportunities, maybe to influence, but not to change people. And when you can be in your mission, it's very easy to lead from that point And lead not from a pushing energy, because think about what a leader does. A leader inspires others to follow. A leader does not try to drag people across the finish line. When we get focused on what other people are or are not doing, we waste our energy. And what's worse is we focus then on negativity and the lack instead of the bigness of the vision and staying true to that and having our actions be in integrity. So when we can do that, we can find our anchor during the storm. 
we can find that purpose that energizes us when it feels like so much is depleting us. We can be grateful for what's going right instead of focused on what's going wrong. And we can be more strategic about how to influence the situation to lead to better outcomes in the future. We can be the mirror of positive behavior that people will attach to and reflect back instead of the negative energy that people will then amplify as well. So focus on what is in your control. Don't be stoic through the stressful times. Realize that you still have choices and make the better choices for yourself and others. Know what you want out of a situation, not what someone told you you should want, not what you think is some bigger goal, but rather what you want in terms of the growth opportunity. Because advancement, which is the external picture of things, and growth are not the same thing. In doing this, you will go a long way to curing your emotional hangover. Take a break when you can from those busy times. Know that you are more productive when you do nothing and get all seven forms of rest that you need to get and then go back to what you need to do. Then when you push and push and push, Let that cyclone of energy slow down to a nice gentle breeze that's refreshing and that creates movement and energy without creating chaos. Thank you so much for listening today. I am always so grateful to have your support in the audience and I wanted to let you know that I now have a YouTube channel in place, so you can listen to the podcast there. There's also some additional shorts and video content that you can find that is not part of the podcast, and it's just one more way to interact. So I will put a link in the show notes, but you can also find it as architecting in YouTube and Make sure that you subscribe. Make sure that you get yourself in there and get all of the goodness. And if you are loving this podcast, tell a friend who could benefit from this. Make sure you like, rate, and review the podcast. That's another way to pay it forward because the way that all the podcast platforms work is algorithm-based. The more positive attention a show gets, the more that show gets shown to others who have an interest in that content. And I so appreciate you. I want to hear about how you are moving past your emotional hangovers. Put something on Instagram and tag me at Architecting Podcast or Write something in the architecting page on LinkedIn, or you can email me directly. I love hearing from you. Have a great day, and I will see you next time. Thank you for listening. You made it all the way to the end of the episode, which means you are committed to making yourself a priority so you can be empowered to do the work you were called to do in the world. How amazing is that? If you would like even more content just like this, please remember to subscribe so you never miss an episode. I would so appreciate it if you left an honest review too. Hey, I want you to know I'm here for you beyond the boundaries of this podcast. You can follow me on social media at Architecting Podcast or visit architectingpodcast.com to download some great free resources. Take care, everyone, and stay inspired. (laughs) 